Thanks everybody for joining us uh, for this very exciting announcement this morning. We, um, we all know that we need to confront the climate crisis that is already impacting all of our communities. And personally, as sort of a recovering engineer, I'm always looking for the real and pragmatic 80% solutions that, that get us to places rather than arguing about how we're going to do the final little touches to get someplace. And thanks to decades of work by researchers and entrepreneurs and scientists, we actually know what we need to do. Uh, by introducing the Electrifying America's Future Resolution, we are saying loud and clear that our climate challenge is a solvable challenge. And when we solve it, we create millions of new, good-paying jobs that can't be outsourced. Local, high-wage, blue-collar jobs in plumbing, in electrical, in efficiency, in HVAC. We reduce our energy bills to our constituents, and we improve air quality and public health. Put another way, we save lives. We already have the technologies that we need to address this problem. What we need are the right policies and incentives to transition to 100% clean and carbon-free, uh, carbon pollution-free future. The key to this path is really to electrify nearly every device, machine, appliance, in our homes, in our garages, in, in our businesses that currently use combustion. And that means replacing our gas ranges with safer induction ranges, replacing gas furnace, furnaces with heat pumps, and replacing our gas-powered vehicles, gasoline in this case, with better electrified alternatives. We urgently need to accelerate the adoption of these off-the-shelf, existing, proven technologies in all of our homes, businesses, and workplaces. Let me be clear, none of this is pie in the sky. This is pie that you can bake with the ingredients at your local grocery store. That's the point. And at the same time, we need to modernize the electricity grid, build much more clean energy generation, and continue on the path towards decarbonizing the entire electricity sector by 2035. Electrifying America's future will dramatically reduce our carbon pollution, create millions of new good paying jobs, save lives and money, and secure a better, more equitable future. That's what Electrifying America's Future Resolution is all about. The resolution lays out a clear vision for how we can achieve our climate requirements with incredible co-benefits. I like to think of this as an engineer's approach to climate action that America can and should implement right now. Many of these actions are policies that many of us have already been working on and trying to advance in the Energy and Natural Resources Committee to build a clean energy future. But I want to acknowledge all of the inspiration and all of the collaboration in particular that came from the organization Rewiring America. Rewiring has advanced a policy framework that demonstrates not just the dramatic climate benefits, but also the significant economic and jobs benefits for every community that can come with widespread electrification. When I think about this issue, I always think about my dad. Uh, my dad was an IBEW lineman. The wages and the benefits that, that he earned by keeping the lights on for my neighbors were also my family's ticket to the middle class and to education. And the jobs that we'll be creating by electrifying America's future will look a lot like his job. We're talking about local high-wage jobs that can't be outsourced. We're talking about guys and women driving around in panel trucks, wiring in new 240 volt circuits, or installing mini splits and heat pumps and water heaters. These are the jobs and trades that will help us build our newly electrified clean energy economy. Tradesmen and women will install, maintain, even manufacture all these new solutions right here in America. And they will build the new clean energy generation and the transmission projects that will power our economy without emitting climate warming pollution. President Biden said it really well last month. He said that when he thinks about climate action, he thinks jobs, jobs, jobs. Well, this resolution, it lays out what those jobs will be and how we can prepare our workforce and our communities 
for all of these new opportunities. So let's get to work on this. And with that, I'm going to introduce my colleague, Senator Whitehouse, who will be followed by Senator Padilla. Thank you, Martin. The uh, pathway to a safe climate future is clouded with fossil fuel industry lies, propaganda, and misrepresentations. And through all that, our engineer in the Senate, Martin Heinrich, has been able to cut a clear engineer's path showing that this is doable. It's doable with things we know. And in doing this, we will form a stronger economy and a stronger America, setting aside all the climate benefits. There are jobs here as we transition from fossil fuel to clean, renewable power. There are jobs at every level. There are jobs in every state. We are seeing it in Rhode Island right now, where our success at getting the first steel in the water and the first electrons on the grid from offshore wind have prompted a revolution that the Biden administration promises will produce 30 gigawatts of clean offshore wind. And I will tell you that our labor unions are very excited about those extraordinary strong jobs and what that will do to lift Rhode Island's economy. This is not only up and down throughout the economy, but it's also across the country from east to west coast. So let me uh, hand the microphone over from Rhode Island to California. Senator Padilla. Thank you uh, first to uh, Senator Heinrich for bringing us all together here uh, to uh, introduce this important measure uh, that will help electrify our nation and uh, move us towards an emissions-free future. Uh, I too am, uh, I won't say a re recovering engineer, I don't think you ever recover from you know, earning your engineering degree, but uh, part of the small but growing and powerful engineer caucus in the United States Senate. Uh, and I too love to see the practical solutions to our most pressing challenges. You know, electrifying industries like manufacturing and transportation and others while also mindfully helping working families finance uh, the electrification projects uh, is going to be critical to helping achieve our emission reduction and climate change goals. You know, in this moment of crisis for California and frankly for the nation, uh, with increasing wildfires, uh, heat waves, drought, rising ocean levels, we are reminded that we must end our reliance on fossil fuels sooner rather than later. We must act with urgency to decarbonize our economy if we are to prevent the worst impacts of our changing climate. So electrifying America has the potential to meet our carbon reduction goals while also creating millions of good paying jobs with strong labor protections in the process. Further, rebuilding our infrastructure should also mean intentionally investing in communities of color, communities that have been most impacted by climate change, pollution, and environmental injustice. Now, I grew up in the working class community of Pacoima, California, in the Northeast San Fernando Valley, where uh, as children, it was not uncommon for us to be sent home from school early or kept indoors because of bad air quality. Working class communities have for too long been on the front lines of the climate crisis. And so we also need to ensure that they're on the front lines of electrification efforts like the ones we're talking about today. Now, this resolution also calls for 
more access to higher education, vocational training, and the certification programs for electrification workers. So as we work towards a greener economy, we're also building a stronger and more inclusive economy. So here's the bottom line. We're all aware of the problem. We need to reach a net zero carbon emissions by 2050. But we also know the solution. Clean electricity and an economy that is reconfigured to take advantage of it. We have the answers to tackle climate change. Now we're just building the political will to make the changes necessary to put fossil fuels behind us. Let's get to work. Thank you, Senator Heinrich. And uh, if we're uh, passing the baton here, let me uh, turn it over to my colleague, Senator Dick Blumenthal. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I feel like I ought to be saying, this land is your land, this land is my land. We're going from California to Connecticut, from Rhode Island, uh, but it really is. We're, we're going to stuff New Mexico into the words. <laughs> <laughs> but New Mexico, New Mexico is leading. Uh, and that really is one of the most important points I can make. Uh, Martin Heinrich has really been at the lead of this effort. He has championed it. Uh, I want to express to him my personal thanks, as well as on behalf of all of our colleagues who are joining in this effort, and to the advocates who are here. You are really the ones who are driving and powering this movement. So uh, to, the, to the moms, to the environmentalists, to everybody on our side here, thank you so much. Uh, it is enormously meaningful. And it really is a national issue. You know, we tend to think of our state as being the epicenter of the world. And of course, each of our states is. But we also know that emissions and the pollutants that are emitted by power plants have no respect for state boundaries. As Attorney General, I sued power plants located in the mid Midwest. Right now, the power plant in York Haven, Pennsylvania, not New Haven, Connecticut, is emitting powerful contaminants that are doing harm to Connecticut the Brunner Power Plant in York Haven, Pennsylvania, is just one example of how air contamination, pollution, crosses state lines. We all have a stake in electrifying the entire nation. And it is really a win-win. It's not only lower emissions and cleaner air, it is also lower electricity rates across the country. The more we mass produce electricity, learn how to transmit it and store it, and make sure that we use clean sources of energy, the lower the rates are going to be. And we know in Connecticut, because we have pretty high rates, how important protecting consumers is. So this vision is a win-win for Connecticut and every single state across the country. And that's why this resolution is so profoundly important. It is a step that should be bipartisan. It should unite us as a nation. Red states, blue states, electrification is the key to all of them. And I'm really proud to stand here today with so many of my colleagues and we're going to get it done. We have to get it done. It's a matter of our, literally our survival. So thank you to Senator Heinrich and uh, all of our colleagues who are here today. And I think I'm now passing it back to Senator Heinrich. Well, if we can get some transmission built, New Mexico will be happy to send you some very cheap renewable energy. Um, uh, it is my honor now to introduce uh, Ari Matusia, 
from Rewiring America. And I just want to say again how grateful I am for, for as an organization, pulling all of these things together that are, that are so evident but not evident because they haven't been articulated in the way that Rewiring America has, has been doing. And uh, uh, thank you to the organization for really being the spark plug uh, to get us all working together and moving in the same direction. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Senator. Um, without changing a single policy, and by the most conservative estimates, over half of American households would save $27 billion on their energy bills today if the next time their furnace went out, their water heater went out, and their stovetop went out, they replaced it with a clean, efficient electric appliance. The thing that's getting in the way of that is political will and a plan to transition our economy to an electrified future. But thanks to Senator Heinrich and all of the other senators here and the 15 co-sponsors of this Electrifying America's Future resolution, we have a plan and we have a demonstration that the political will is here today. We started rewiring America for two reasons. The first is the recognition that we cannot address our climate crisis without electrifying the economy the entire economy. And the second is, is that America should be leading on the transition to a clean energy future in the world, maintaining its political and economic primacy for the 21st century and beyond. Most of the time when you hear about the climate crisis, it is framed in terms of the need for moonshot technologies or sacrifice that we each are gonna have to make to adapt to a new reality. From our perspective at Rewiring America, the conversation is really not about moonshots. It's about, the, it's about the discussions that we each have at our kitchen tables each and every month. Because the reality is, the decisions that we make at our kitchen tables are responsible for 42% of the energy-related emissions in the United States. Our, our path forward requires us to electrify 121 million households. And that means building and installing one billion machines. Think about that for a second. A billion machines. That is an incredible opportunity for this country. Senator Heinrich and his fellow co-sponsors have created a plan that gets us to that future state. And let's understand what the implications are of that. Every American household will save on their energy bills up to $2,500 a year. Low and moderate income households will be the most benefited of all. We will create millions of jobs in every zip code in the United States that can't be offshored or outsourced and that pay family sustaining wages. And our families and our kids will be healthier and safer as a result of not burning fossil fuels in our homes, creating noxious pollutants that would make that would make outdoor air quality standards, uh, would violate outdoor air quality standards. We have the path forward now. Senator Heinrich and, and his colleagues have put forward a resolution that is our roadmap. We should follow it, and we are eager to join hands with them and all of our colleagues and friends in doing so. Thank you very much. Uh, it's my pleasure now to introduce someone who is actually doing this work is making the rubber hit the road, is making sure that people who live in buildings, that today where they're breathing air quality that, that frankly no one should be breathing, are having access to the solutions that will really move public health forward and the climate forward together. Not to mention bring down uh, uh, the money that we all have to pay every month for our electricity and, and other utility bills. Uh, Rose Steffens Booker is with Block Power, and they are leading the way in proving that this can be done right now. Thank you. I am honored to stand here today among so many committed and fearless leaders like Senator Heinrich and others to speak on how we can address climate change together while also advancing energy and economic equity cleaner air, and greener, healthier buildings. 
I work at Block Power, a minority-owned, venture-backed climate tech startup that focuses on analyzing, financing, and installing efficient in all electric energy equipment in low-income buildings across America. We are committed to rapid electrification of our cities and states to help combat the climate crisis and improve health outcomes as we begin to emerge from this pandemic, to placing environmental justice communities first that have been long ne neglected and overlooked, and to launching several new clean energy industries to employ millions of Americans for generations to come. Now is the time to put Americans to work. Let us leverage advanced electrification technologies, technologies and equitable financing tools to green America's approximately 120 million aging buildings. On behalf of the entire Block Power team, I stand here today to say we are ready to green buildings for all people and address together in partnership the concurrent and connected crises, climate change, high unemployment, health issues, and economic and racial inequity. We challenge businesses and other local governments to join us, all of us, in this movement to electrify America. Thank you. And now we're going to hear from Tricia Dello Iacano from Moms Clean Air Force, who have been a uh, very uh, persuasive voice on these issues in, uh, in the last few years, and we're really grateful for their support. Good afternoon. I am Trisha Della Iacono, the National Field and Legislative Manager for Moms Clean Air Force. Thank you to Senator Heinrich and all of his colleagues for the opportunity to uh, speak today. We are an organization of over one million moms and dads fighting to protect the clean air for the sake of our children's health. The climate crisis is a health crisis that is threatening our children right now. That's why moms want our leaders to take action to cut the pollution causing climate change. The climate crisis is also disproportionately harming black and brown communities. We need solutions now to ensure our children have a livable, safe, and equitable future. One of the most promising things we can do is electrify highly polluting sectors that are making climate change worse and make our air dirty. Electrifying the appliances and machines that burn fossil fuels will slash the kind of pollution that trigger asthma and heart attacks and send people to the emergency room. The Electrifying America's Future Resolution will help families literally breathe easier as we cut more and more pollution from our buildings as well as from the construction, transportation, and manufacturing sectors. Moms Clean Air Force applauds Senator Heinrich for leading the way in transitioning American homes and businesses and prioritizing public health to address the climate crisis. The elect I want to tell you a story about my colleague, Cynthia Moore. She leads our Latino outreach program called Eco Madres. She lives in Las Vegas, Nevada, a city that recently re received a failing grade for air quality from the American Lung Association and where there is near constant construction. Cynthia says, there's just heavy vehicles 24 seven. And since moving from a suburb to her predominantly Latino community in the city, Cynthia says the disparity in air quality could not be clearer as her son, Liam, cannot go outdoors without having a bad reaction. Both she and Liam have suffered respiratory issues. While air purifiers work well indoors, Cynthia said, as soon as as soon as her son is outside, he breaks out in rashes and has trouble breathing. Cynthia is just one of countless moms who find themselves needing to protect their children from air pollution. And yet, we parents can't control the air our children breathe. We need our leaders to take action to cut harmful air pollution to protect Liam in Las Vegas and all the children breathing polluted air. Electrifying vehicles, machinery, and appliances will go a long way toward cutting harmful pollution. With the introduction of the Electrifying America's Future Resolution, we are just one step closer to addressing the climate crisis and helping people like Cynthia and their families breathe clean air. Thank you. And uh, bad and clean up here is my good friend Sam Ricketts from Evergreen Action. 
Thank you, Senator. Thank you all for being here today. I'll be very brief. Um, good afternoon. Uh, I am today, I, I am grateful, I am confident, and I am eager. Um, uh, I am grateful today for the leadership of Senator Martin Heinrich and his fellow senators for their leadership on this Amer Electrifying America's Future Resolution. I'm grateful to my colleagues in advocacy for fighting for and, and, make, and working their work to make this vision a, real a reality here in Congress. Uh, for as long as I've known him for over a decade, the Senator, Senator Heinrich has been a stalwart champion who fights every day diligently for New Mexicans, for working people, for climate solutions, for, and for building a just and thriving clean energy economy. Uh, and I'm grateful for this vision that these senators, 15 of them today, have brought forward to the Congress for electrifying America's future. Uh, I'm confident as well in this, in, this, um, in this package. This is a vision, a bold vision for how we actually confront the climate crisis, put millions of people to work, building a more just and thriving clean energy economy. How we get that 30% of gas use out of our buildings as, as across the country. How we put people to work in literally every community, re retrofitting and upgrading buildings, installing electric efficient appliances, uh, installing uh, DG Solar, uh, installing electric vehicle charging stations. This is a jobs plan. This is a jobs plan. This is a jobs plan that's also going to ensure it saves our planet. Um, and, I'm, and if ever there's been a question in the past about do we have the technology, do we have the policy, those questions have long been answered. This is a, these are things we can do now. These are things we can start installing today that people will save people money, will cut pollution, will create jobs. And, and then lastly, uh, I'm eager. I'm eager to see uh, our, our champion senators here put this vision to work at play in Congress now as Congress gears up to respond to the President's American Jobs Plan with its own investment strategy for building this just and thriving clean energy economy. Behind us, this building is going to decide here what happens and, and how Congress can respond to the interwoven crises facing this country, the economic challenge we've been dealing with because of the COVID pandemic, the climate crisis, the crisis of institutional racism, um, even a, dem a democratic crisis. We have an opportunity now to reinvest in a just and thriving American clean energy economy run on clean electricity. Uh, and lastly, I'll just offer the words of the immortal words of Marsha Griffiths, who in 1983 in her song said about the clean energy, see, prophetically about the clean energy future, ladies and gentlemen, it's electric. And with that, we'll uh, open things up for questions. Shoot. Okay, thank you for joining us. Um, you know, Sam mentioned it a little bit, but I'm wondering, you know, how much of this you see fitting into the current debate on infrastructure and what a sort of rough, you know, number for the kind of investment in these ideas that you're looking for. I think what we're trying to do right here is create the narrative. Uh, that's why this is a resolution about how this must be in, uh, informing our decisions on infrastructure. And then as we move forward, we're gonna be working with all of these organizations and labor and many other groups to put the, the individual Lego blocks into the bigger picture, right? And, and make sure that not only the investments are there, but also investments in things like workforce to make sure that uh, people know how to do these things, working with industry to make sure, uh, I'll give you an anecdote, like most people, when they replace their water heater, it's an emergency. So if you don't have the heat pump, air source heat pump water heater on the back of the truck, it's not going in the house. You, you want hot water tomorrow, and if your in-laws are over, you want it now. So we need to figure out all of these friction points and use the, the jobs and infrastructure package to really be able to solve these friction points. Because like you heard before, all of the technology is already here. It's about the training, it's about the financing, it's about each and every one of those little friction points that keeps us from doing what's already available. How do you think you ensure uh, you know, these jobs are the kind of union good paying jobs you're talking about? Obviously, this isn't just about wind and solar, of course, but it's, you know, wind and solar is unionized at a, a lower rate than oil and gas. Yeah, and I think, one, we need to do a better job in those projects. Uh, however, you know, I've really had an enormous amount of luck working with IBW as just one example on these transmission projects, on making sure that we have, uh, uh, that we have not only union, but in places where that uh, prevailing wage, that it applies to these policies. And we're going to bake that in to not only this resolution, but to individual policies 
uh, moving forward. And I, I think it's really important to realize that um, so many of these jobs are the kind of jobs that are already being trained for by the trade unions. I mean, when you think about a huge portion of this solution is about plumbing in new water heaters that also usually require a new 220 volt service and, uh, and a, you know, a new breaker in the, in the service panel. Like that is bread and butter, uh, plumbers and pipe fitters, IBW electricians kind of work. Um, and, and we need to be responsive to that because we want these jobs to be uh, union and prevailing wage. Are there parts of your vision, your roadmap, that you think will be an easier sell for um, Republicans? And are there aspects that might be a little bit tougher? I know there's been a lot of debate over, for example, electric vehicle provisions and the infrastructure package. Yeah, so I think the advantage of many of these things is that they haven't been subject to the culture war, but it doesn't mean it, that won't be the case a year from now. So right now, I think people intuitively get if you can swap out an appliance and save money, uh, if you have the financing structure in place to do that, that's just a no brainer. And it's something that that any Republican who's a CPA is going to get right away. Um, I think the, the bigger challenge is some of these things that have become lightning rods, uh, more to do with, you know, uh, people's talk radio shows and cable news shows than the actual sort of performance of the underlying technology on the ground. What would you characterize as a lightning rod? Well, I think, you know, electric vehicles, despite the fact that they have lower cost of ownership, uh, just the, despite the fact that they're a lot more fun to drive, speaking personally, I've got both, um, you know, they, uh, they have become uh, a uh, just another weapon in the culture wars. That said, they're a giant opportunity for us to build cars here in America that we can export to the rest of the world. And, um, you know, I, I for one am very much looking forward to uh, Ford rolling out their electric F-150 here this week. That's the kind of investment in the future of America that we should be making. So not speaking for committee chairs, since uh, I, I'm not the chair of the, the relevant committees here, but I, I personally think we need to do something on jobs and infrastructure before we leave for August break. Any question? The general feeling, uh, again, I'm not speaking for committee chairs either, is that we've reached a critical mass sooner rather than later we need to seize this moment and uh, i might just add uh, on lightning rods every one of these ideas on its merits makes eminent common sense and our colleagues are going to hear about it when they go home over this break in the next couple of weeks i think the american people are ready for it and i don't think there's any part of this agenda, which on its merits should be a lightning rod in the sense of attracting opposition. Thanks, everybody.